Hello everyone, welcome to another video of the RFPB series. My name is Mark and today we are going to talk about the general banking law as well as other related laws. Now, this is going to be a long one, so make sure to have all of your snacks at the ready. With that said, let's begin. So again, we're going to discuss about general banking law and other related laws. General banking law is Republic Act number 8791 and acted in the year 2000. Now, if you're going to wonder whether or not we're going to tackle all of the provisions of general banking law from section one to the very last section, we're not going to do that because if we're going to tackle every single legal profession out there in the general banking law, it might take us a semester or half of it to finish up. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the most basic question. What are banks? Now under section 3.1 of the general banking law, banks shall refer to entities engaged in the lending of funds obtained in the form of deposits. Now, this might actually be different from the perception of people as to banks, because with regards to people, they might think that the bank's primary function is to actually collect deposits of people in order for their money to be safe. Now do take note class that the bank's primary function is not merely to safe keep your money, but it's actually to lend out money. Now the reason why banks uh, collect deposits from their clients and customers is because they need money in order for them to allow other people to borrow money off of them. So that's why usually they take the funds from the public in the form of deposits. So again, the primary function of banks uh, is to lend money. They are engaged in the lending of funds. They are not primarily engaged to keep your money safe. Of course, we're going to talk about that later on. What does safekeeping of money actually mean? How are banks actually organized? So here, the monetary board, which is, of course, the one that exercises the power and function of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. So they may authorize the organization of a bank or quasi bank subject to the following conditions. Number one, the entity is a stock corporation. And this is very important because a person cannot create a bank on his own. There must be a stock corporation in order for the monetary board to authorize to turn it or transform it into a bank or to authorize it into engaging in banking practice. The second requirement is that its funds are obtained from the public. And when we say public, it shall mean 20 or more persons. Now, of course, with regards to bank, there is no problem with obtaining funds from 20 or more persons. A single bank even contains a lot of accounts for their depositors, if not hundreds, maybe thousands, even tens of thousands. And that's why this requirement is easily satisfied. So again, it must be obtained or the funds of the bank must be obtained from the public. And when we say public, it shall mean 20 or more persons. Now, the last requirement is that the minimum capital requirements prescribed by the monetary board for each category of banks are satisfied. Now, as we learn later on, there are several classes of banks, from universal banks to commercial banks, and even down to the rural banks. So depending on what kind of bank you would like to organize, there is a specific minimum capital requirement for you to satisfy in order for the monetary board to authorize you with the power to engage in banking practices. So again, take note of the three requirements here in order for a bank to be organized. So what is the nature of banks? Well, according to section two of the general banking law, 
the state recognizes the vital role of banks in providing an environment conducive to the sustained development of the national economy and the fiduciary nature of banking that requires high standards of integrity and performance. In furtherance thereof, the state shall promote and maintain a stable and efficient banking and financial system that is globally competitive, dynamic, and responsive to the demands of a developing economy. So usually the nature of the banks is to provide an environment which is conducive to the sustained development of the national economy. You could see the word economy at the very first sentence, and of course at the last portion of the last sentence here. So usually the nature of the bank is for it or for the banks to support the national economy of the Philippines. Or if we talk about banks in general, of their respective countries to wherever it may be established. So what are the consequences of the nature of banks? Banks are subject to heavy and close supervision and or regulation by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. They are required to exercise utmost diligence in the handling of deposits. And when we say utmost diligence, this is the highest form of diligence. If you have encountered diligence in obligations and contracts, you might be familiar with what we call a diligence of a good father of a family. Now, if you know a little bit about transportation law, there is such a term as extraordinary diligence. However, when it comes to banks, they are required to exercise the highest form of diligence in handling the deposits of their depositors. And of course, with regards to labor, there are special rules on strikes and lockouts. So what are the classification of banks? Well, according to Section 3.2 of the General Banking Law, the following are the classifications of banks. You have your universal banks, your commercial banks, your thrift banks, your rural banks, cooperative banks, Islamic banks, and other classification of banks as determined by the Monetary Board. Now, what are rural banks? According to Attorney Rivera, rural banks are banks primarily engaged in the countryside lending and in lending to farmers and agricultural enterprises. According to Attorney Sunjang Sr. and Attorney Aquino, banks, uh, rural banks are banks that are created to make needed credit available and readily accessible in the rural areas for the purpose of promoting comprehensive rural development. So rural banks are governed by Republic Act number 7353 as amended, otherwise known as the Rural Bank Act of 1992. So loans and advances extended by rural banks organized and operated under the Rural Bank Act shall be primarily for the purpose of meeting the normal credit needs of not only farmers, but also fishermen or farm families owning or cultivating land dedicated to agricultural production, as well as the normal credit needs of cooperatives and merchants in the rural area. So that's according to Section 6 of the Rural Bank Act. So what about thrift banks? A thrift bank is a bank primarily engaged in extending banking services to small and medium enterprises and individuals. With prior monetary board approval, it may open current and checking accounts and engage in quasi-banking operations. Thrift banks provide short-term working capital, medium and long-term financing to business engaged in agriculture, services, industry, and housing. And of course, thrift banks are governed by Republic Act number 7906, otherwise known as the Thrift Banks Act of 1995. So what about cooperative banks? Cooperative banks are cooperatives which have joined together in accordance with the Cooperative Act of the Philippines. These are banks that primarily provide financial, banking, and credit services to cooperative organizations and their members. 
So cooperative banks are governed by Republic Act Number 9520, otherwise known as the Philippine Cooperative Code of 2008. So cooperative banks are, in a sense, cooperatives themselves. So now we go to Islamic banks. According to Attorney Rivera, Islamic banks are banks which provides banking service in accordance with Islam. In Islam, the collection or receipt of interest is forbidden. The funds placed by account holders are invested in transactions and enterprises which are permissible under Islam. Islamic banks are more like investment banks than standard banks. So Islamic banks are governed by Republic Act Number 6848, otherwise known as the Charter of the Al Amana Islamic Investment Bank of the Philippines. So an interesting thing to note about Islamic banks is that there is such a thing as a non-interest bearing deposit. What this means is that the depositors deposit money in the bank, but they will not accumulate interest from their money in the said bank. So that's one thing we should learn. However, there is no stopping these quote unquote depositors from actually investing in an investment scheme provided by the bank instead of depositing the same to the said bank. With that said, whatever interest or what we call quote unquote other income or increase in investment that the investor slash depositor will receive will actually go to that depositor. And a small portion from that increase in value will be shared by the bank. So now let's go to commercial banks. These are banks primarily engaged in extending banking services to small and medium enterprises and individuals. It may open current and checking accounts and invest in the equities of allied undertakings. It may also engage in quasi-banking operations. Uh, commercial banks are banks that are given all such powers necessary to engage in commercial banking in addition to general corporate powers. Commercial banking includes the power to accept drafts, issue letters of credit, discounting, and negotiation of negotiable instruments and evidence of debt, accept and create demand deposits, and the like. So what's the difference between universal banks and commercial banks? Well, universal banks are actually commercial banks. However, they could further exercise the powers of an investment house and invest in non-allied enterprises. Now, do take note previously, we mentioned that commercial banks can invest in other forms of business. However, they are limited to allied undertakings and quasi-banking operations only. However, universal banks can not only engage in those allied undertakings, those quasi-banking institutions, they could also engage in non-allied enterprises as well, in addition to a power of an investment house that provides services in the investment of securities. So here are the terms to note. When we talk about quasi-banking operation or function, the term means borrowing funds for the borrower's own account through the issuance, endorsement, or acceptance of debt instruments of any kind other than deposits, or through the issuance of participations, certificates, or of repurchase agreements from 20 or more lenders at one time for purposes of relending or purchasing of receivables and other similar obligations. Now, do take note that if the borrowing of funds is from 20 or more people in the form of deposit, that is a banking operation or function. That is not quasi-banking. However, if it means borrowing of funds through other means other than the deposit from, more, from 20 or more persons, then that is quasi-banking operation or quasi-banking function. So what is an investment house? An investment house, according to Section 2 of the Investment Houses Law, means any enterprise which engages in the underwriting of securities of other corporations. 
Now, when we talk about allied undertaking, it may either be financial or non-financial allied undertakings. So when we talk about financial allied undertakings and enterprises, according to Section X377 of the Manual of Regulation of Banks, the following industries or enterprises are considered financial allied undertakings or enterprises. So we have the leasing companies, the banks, investment houses, financial companies or financing companies, credit card companies, financial institutions catering to a small and medium scale industries, including venture capital, companies engaged in stock brokerages and securities dealership, companies engaged in foreign exchange brokerage and dealership, and it also includes insurance companies and holding companies that universal banks may invest in. Now, if you look at the enumeration right here, you may note that these are actually financial institutions. But of course, this list is somewhat exclusive. So both the commercial banks and the universal banks can invest in these kinds of enterprises, except for insurance companies and holding companies, which only the universal banks may invest in. So now let's go to non-financial allied undertakings and enterprises. The commercial banks and universal banks can both invest in these kinds of enterprises. I don't think I need to mention one by one because the list here is too long and they are taken from section X380 of Manual of Regulations for Banks. But the thing I would like to point out here is number seven, which is insurance agencies and brokerages. If you could recall financial allied undertakings and enterprises, we have what we call insurance companies. So insurance companies are different from insurance agencies and brokerages. Insurance companies are the insurer of the insurance policy. They are the ones that provide the insurance products. Whereas insurance agencies and brokerages are the one that sells these products. So they are not the insurer, but they are merely the seller of the products. And now we go to non-allied undertakings and enterprises. These enterprises can only be invested by universal banks. Commercial banks cannot invest in these kinds of undertakings. So we have the enterprises engaged in physically productive activities in agriculture, mining and quarrying, manufacturing public utilities, construction, wholesale trade, and community and social services following the industrial groupings in the Philippine Standard Industrial Classification. Meaning to say that universal banks can invest in industries. Number two, industrial park projects and or industrial estate developments. Number three, financial and commercial complex projects, including land development and building constructed thereon, arising from or in connection with the government's privatization program. And finally, number four, such other broad categories as the monetary board may declare as appropriate. And this is taken from section 1381.1 of the Manual of Regulations for Banks. So before we continue on, let's go to the question of the day. What is a hobby, skill, or talent of yours that sounds useless but actually helps you with work or study? Now, if you're going to ask me, I think my answer would be doing origami. You know, paper folding. I really like to create paper cranes. It helps me focus. It actually helps me listen. And it also helps me retain my memory of the things that I hear while I'm doing the said paper folding activity. So origami, it may sound useless, but it actually is very effective on my part. All right, now let's go to the functions of the banks. So we have three functions, the deposit function, the loan function, and of course, the other functions. So let's start with the other functions. So according to section 53 of the general banking law, in addition to operations specifically authorized in the general banking law, a bank may perform the following services as depository or as an agent. Receive in custody funds, documents, and valuable objects. Act as financial agent and buy and sell 
by order of and for the account of their customers, shares, evidences of indebtedness, and all types of securities. Make collections and payments for the account of others and perform such other services for their customers as are not incompatible with banking business. Upon prior approval of the Monetary Board, act as managing agent, advisor, consultant, or administrator of investment management advisory consultancy accounts. And of course, the ever common rent out safety deposit boxes. So these are the other functions of the banks. So now let's go to the deposit function of the banks. According to Article 1980 of the Civil Code of the Philippines, fixed savings and current deposits of money in banks and similar institutions shall be governed by the provisions of simple loan. Now, what do we mean when we talk about simple loan? According to Article 1953 of the Civil Code of the Philippines, a person who receives a loan of money or any fungible thing acquires ownership thereof and is bound to pay to the creditor an equal amount of the same kind and quality. A bank deposit is not actually a deposit under Article 1962 of the Civil Code since safekeeping is not the purpose of the agreement. Now, if you're wondering what legal deposit means, Article 1962 of the Civil Code of the Philippines provides that a deposit is constituted from the moment a person receives the thing belonging to another with the obligation of safely keeping it and of returning the same. If the safekeeping of the thing delivered is not the principal purpose of the contract, there is no deposit but some other contract. Now again, do take note, when a depositor deposits money in the bank, that is not a form of legal deposit. That is a form of loan. This is because banks borrow money from the depositors in order for these banks to lend out these monies to borrowers. So that's actually the main function of bank, to lend out money that they have. So when you deposit money there, you do not expect them to keep the specific money that you have deposited in the bank. So later on, if you try to demand that the bank should return to you the specific serial number of the 1,000 peso bill that you deposited, the bank has no legal obligation to do so. Because what is controlling here is not legal deposit or the provisions of legal deposit, but the provisions of simple loan. So let me repeat, when you deposit money to the bank, you are actually letting the bank borrow money from you. So the money that you give will now belong to the bank. The only right that you have against the bank is to demand the return of that money later on through withdrawal from the bank itself or through ATMs or through banking transfers such as the work transfer. So the bank can use as its own the money deposited. The said amount is not being held in trust for the depositor, nor is it being kept for safekeeping. This is according to attorneys Sunjang Senior and Aquino, citing the Supreme Court case of Tang Kyung Tik, I'm sure I butchered that name, versus American Apothecaries 65 Phil 414. Third persons who may have a right to the money deposited cannot hold the bank responsible unless there is a court order or garnishment. The duty of the bank is to its creator depositor and not to third persons. Again, Sunjang Senior and Aquino cited the case of Fulton Ironworks versus China Bank. So what does this mean actually? So imagine yourself, you are walking down the street carrying 10,000 pesos in your hand when suddenly a person snatched the money from you and ran away. You chased that person and that person went into the bank and quickly deposited that money into the bank. Minutes later, you entered the bank and you know for a fact that the person deposited the money into the bank. Can you demand now the bank to return the money which was stolen from you? The answer here is no, 
you cannot right there and then demand the return of the money because the bank's relationship is as to its depositor. The only way for you to force the bank to return the money which was stolen from you and deposited by the perpetrator in that bank is to actually file a case against the perpetrator and have the court order the bank to return the said money deposited. The officers of the bank cannot be held liable for estafa if they authorize the use of the money deposited by the depositor. So the case of Gingona versus City Fiscal of Manila is cited in this case. So what does this mean? It means that once you deposit your money into the bank, then the bank is free to do whatever it wants with your money, whether to circulate it, to lend it, or to spend it. So you cannot file a case of estafa against the bank or its officers just because you knew that they used up the money that you deposited there. Again, let's go back to the rule that you depositing money to the bank is a form of loan. You are letting the bank borrow your money. Therefore, the bank may use that money in any way that it pleases, whether to just keep it there in its vault, to circulate it, or to use it in any way, whether through spending or to let other borrowers borrow that money. So the bank has the right to compensation. It can set off the deposits with the indebtedness of the depositor that are due and demandable. So if you remember your law on obligations and contracts, you would know that in compensation, you could actually offset the debts of the parties which are both creditors and debtors to each other. So now let's go to the loan function. This is the primary function of the bank. A bank shall grant loans and other credit accommodations only in amounts and for the periods of time essential for the effective completion of the operations to be financed. Such grant of loans and other credit accommodations shall be consistent with safe and sound banking practices. Before the grant of a loan or other credit accommodation, a bank must ascertain that the debtor is capable of fulfilling his commitment to the bank. So usually when you want to borrow money from the bank, it's very hard for you to apply for a loan because there are many requirements from providing your tax clearances or your uh, income tax returns to providing your payroll and proof that you could repay your you can repay the loan you applied for. So it's very strict and there are many requirements when you want to apply for a loan in a bank. Now, the reason for this is not because they are greedy and they only want your money. The reason is because they have to exercise the highest form of diligence of the land. So if they let any person borrow money from them, they are not actually exercising diligence. So if they want to exercise the highest form of diligence, they must ascertain that the borrower is able to pay the debt that they will incur when they take out a loan in the bank or from the bank. So we also have what we call a single borrower's limit. According to Section 35.1 of the General Banking Law, uh, consistent with national interests, the total amount of loans credit accommodations, and guarantees that may be extended by a bank to any person, partnership, association, corporation, or other entity shall at no time exceed 25% of the network of such bank. The basis for determining compliance with the single borrower's limit is the total credit commitment of the bank to or on behalf of the borrower. Now, do take note, class, that with regards to BSP circulars in the current times, you could actually increase this limit of 25%. So the total amount of loans, credit accommodations, and guarantees prescribed in the first paragraph may be increased depending on the given circumstance. And this is according to Section 35.2. So again, there are certain instances where the single borrower's limit is 35%. There are some instances where it is higher than 35%. So do take note of that. So banks are prohibited to act as insurer. 
So a bank shall not directly engage in insurance business as the insurer. This is according to Section 54, General Banking Law. Now you might be wondering, don't some banks sell insurance? Well, do remember, class, that we are talking about the bank being an insurer. There is no prohibition with regards to bank investing in insurance companies as well as insurance agencies. So the reason why it's fairly common to see banks uh, promoting certain insurance products is because they also invested in insurance companies or insurance agencies. So they have an interest there. What the law prohibits is for the bank to actually be the insurer. Because we all know that the insurer is the one who is paying the claims of the insured. So imagine the bank who is tasked to lend money by borrowing from depositors will also now be paying the insurance claims of the insured. This would really affect their financial position should many insured claim insurance. That's why there is a prohibition for banks to actually be the insurer or to actually and directly engage in insurance business as the insurer. But again, there is no stopping them from investing in insurance companies as well as insurance agencies. Now we have a term called bank assurance. It is from section 375 of the Insurance Code of the Philippines. Bank assurance is the presentation and sale to bank customers by an insurance company of its insurance products within the premises of the head office of such banks duly licensed by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or any of its branches. So what about prohibition against outsourcing inherent banking function? According to Section X162.2 of the Manual Regulations for Banks, no bank shall outsource inherent banking functions such as taking deposits from the public, granting of loans and extensions, managing of risk exposures, and general management. Now do take note what is prohibited by the law is the outsourcing of inherent banking functions. If you're going to outsource a function or a service which is not considered as an inherent banking function, then it's okay. It's not prohibited. So what is outsourcing? Outsourcing shall refer to any contractual arrangement between a bank and a qualified service provider for the latter to perform designated activities on a continuing legal basis on behalf of the bank. This is according to Section X162.2 of the Manual of Regulation for Banks. All right, so we are now going to the kinds of deposits. Now, the kinds of deposits here, and do take note that these are not the only forms of deposits. So we have the savings account, the time deposit, the demand deposit or current account, and the joint account. Now, remember, there are other forms of accounts, and it depends upon the bank on what kind of accounts that they provide. There is even a concept of what we call a trust account. But I think we have to save the discussion for a future topic. So let's go first to the savings deposit. According to Attorney Rivera, the most common form of savings where the purpose is for the depositor to save his money or for convenience is what we call a savings deposit. Since in practice, the money may be withdrawn at any time, the interest paid by the bank is minimal. And of course, with the current settings, usually we can open savings accounts that don't even have interest. Because of course, their minimum maintaining balance required is lower than normal. So do take note that according to Section X214 of the Manual of Regulations for Banks, banks are prohibited from issuing or accepting withdrawal slips or any other similar instruments designed to affect withdrawals of savings deposit without requiring the depositors or concern to present their passbooks and accomplishing the necessary withdrawal slips, except for banks authorized by the BSP to adopt the no passbook withdrawal system. Now, in this current time, usually 
people would opt to create savings accounts without the passbook. Because usually, if you request a passbook account, your maintaining balance would be higher compared to that with a no passbook uh, account. So with that said, this rule will not apply anymore to these kinds of accounts without any passbook. Because of course, they don't have any kind of passbook to show in the first place. So how can you enforce this kind of rule to them? So those depositors without any passbooks, because their saving accounts uh, do not have passbooks, can go to the bank, can just fill up the withdrawal slip, and can withdraw money directly from the bank. But of course, for convenience sake, people would usually now withdraw through ATMs rather than to lining up in the bank and actually withdrawing money. But do remember that there is a limit with regards to ATM withdrawals. Now, I'm not sure if it is different from bank to bank, but from what I am aware of, it's 10,000 pesos. That is the maximum that you can withdraw in the ATM machine for each day. So this is different if you're going to withdraw the money directly from the bank by signing a withdrawal slip and by lining up inside the bank. Because, of course, there is no limit as to what you can withdraw. If you want to withdraw all of your monies, you can do so. Now, another thing to discuss about the savings deposit is that there are many forms. Again, I have mentioned earlier that you could actually open a savings deposit with little to no maintaining balance required. However, the consequence of that is that it might have little to no interest. So it will not accumulate interest as it stays in the bank. So we also have the concept of a payroll account. A payroll account is a kind of savings deposit wherein instead of giving the employees directly the money or check which reflects their compensation, they instead deposit it to the bank through wire transfer. So in this case, it's much more convenient on the part of the employer and at the same time the employee because he does not need to go to the employer or to the releasing office of that, of that company in order for him to get his check or his money in reflection of his salaries. He could merely wait until an announcement has been made that the salary has been deposited in the bank account and he could actually dispose, withdraw, or spend the money the moment he checks his payroll account. So let's go to time deposit. A time deposit is a deposit made for a fixed period and which may not be pre-terminated prior to the maturity date unless a pre-termination penalty is paid. The interest paid is consequently higher than a savings account. But checking the websites of our banks currently, usually the interest rate is not that high. So I don't think that it is, uh, that it is advisable for you to invest in short-term time deposit. So it may be effective or it may be helpful if you're going to invest in long-term time deposit. But with regards to short-term time deposit, the difference between the savings account interest and the time deposit interest is not so much. And in fact, there are some banks that only offers the same interest. So again, before you try to invest or to open up a time deposit, you have to make sure what you are getting yourself into. So do not enter into a time deposit thinking that you would accumulate interest that quickly. Now let's go to demand deposit or current account or otherwise known as the checking account. So demand deposits means all those liabilities of the Banco Central and of other banks which are denominated in Philippine currency and are subject to payment in legal tender upon demand by the presentation of checks. This is according to Section 58 of the new Central Bank Act. Now, do take note that with regards to checking accounts, these are the accounts that will be deducted once the check which you have issued to a person will be in cash. So you cannot issue a check and then request the bank to deduct it from your savings account you have to create a demand deposit or current account or checking account 
in order for you to actually be able to issue checks to other people. Generally, only a universal bank or a commercial bank can accept or create demand deposits. A bank other than a universal bank or a commercial bank cannot accept deposits except upon prior approval of the monetary board. Temporary overdrawing against current accounts shall not be allowed unless caused by normal bank charges and other fees incidental to the handling of such accounts. Now let's go to joint accounts. Whenever two or more persons open an account, the same is considered as a joint account and may either be an OR account or an END account. An OR account requires only the signature of either account holders for withdrawals. An END account requires the signatures of all account holders. Account holders of joint accounts are presumed co-owners of the same. Such presumption, however, may be overturned by contrary evidence. Under the NIRC, the bank shall not allow a withdrawal from a joint account if it has knowledge of the debt of an account holder, unless the company has certified that the estate taxes has been paid. For this purpose, all withdrawal slips shall contain a statement to the effect that all of the joint depositors are still living at the time of the withdrawal by one of the joint depositors, and such statement shall be under oath by the said depositors. Now do take note that under the train law, the bank may opt to withhold 6% from the amount inside that bank account in relation to estate taxes in order for the remaining amount to be withdrawn by the co-depositor of that joint account. So that's something new with regards to the train law. And so that people who are co-depositors in an account wherein one depositor is actually dead can easily withdraw the money from that bank account without getting a certification from the BIR that the estate taxes of that deceased person has been paid. And so that ends our lecture for today. I know it's been a long one because general banking law really covers a lot of topics. So if you want to check out my sources, I actually used the Reviewer on Commercial Law, 2019 edition, authored by Attorney Sunjang Sr. and Attorney Aquino, as well as the 2019 Jurist Notes prepared by Rigera. So that is it with regards to the general banking law. I know it's a long one, but the law really covers a lot of topics. So with that said, my name is Mark. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. I'll see you next time.